the Washington office of the Palestine Liberation Organization served as a de facto Palestinian diplomatic mission in the U.S. capital. Last year, the Trump administration shut it down. Now the government has denied a U.S. travel visa to a senior PLO executive. Hanan Ashrawi has negotiated with U.S. secretaries of state and met several presidents. So the decision earlier this month to bar her entry to the United States for the first time came as quite a surprise. But many see it fitting a pattern of Trump forging stronger ties with Israel at the expense of the Palestinians. So why was she refused entry? Well, let's ask Hanan Ashrawi herself. She's a PLO executive, a member of the Palestinian Legislative Council, and among the most prominent figures in Palestinian politics today. She joins us now from Ramallah in the occupied West Bank. Good to talk to you once again, ma'am. Why do you think they rejected your visa? Well, the most obvious reason is, of course, political, and it is rather petty and vindictive in the sense that they don't like uh, my statements or, or positions critical of the American uh, policies and this administration's policies and unilateral illegal actions. Uh, this is one. But basically, as you said, it is part of a pattern. It comes in the wake of a long uh, a series of actions that are extremely prejudicial, starting with Jerusalem. In, in the sense that they uh, recognized Israel's illegal annexation of Jerusalem and moved the American embassy there. And then they moved to target the Palestinian refugees and UNRWA, which is the international agency entrusted with the well-being and rights of the Palestinian refugees. Then they defunded all of Palestini Palestinian projects, whether infrastructure or hospitals in Jerusalem or even scholarships. And then they, they refused to acknowledge the two-state solution. They refused mm. to uh, describe the settlements as illegal. They closed down our office in Washington. They closed down the consulate general in Jeru the American consulate general in Jerusalem, which was supposed to serve the Palestinians since 1844. This is part of our history, and it's a diplomatic representation to the Palestinians. And they moved ahead with several other steps, which meant that uh, this administration has waged an unrelenting or relentless war against the Palestinians, whether it's economic or mm -hmm. whether it's political and diplomatic. And they targeted us collectively and individually. It's very petty, and it's rather, in many ways, the, the denial of my visa is rather childish, I think. Right. The U.S. Embassy says that visa records are confidential under U.S. law. Therefore, we cannot discuss the details of individual visa, visa <laughs> cases. So they're not saying why. Interestingly enough, a month ago, I had a conversation with Omar Barghouti, who also was denied a visa to the U.S. Now, interestingly... He's a BDS founder. He calls for one state. You're a big supporter of the two-state solution. So on both ends of the, of the kind of Palestinian political spectrum, both denied entry to the U.S. What does that tell you about the way they see mm -hmm. all Palestinian mm -hmm. attempts at peace and justice? I think they look at us as guilty by virtue of our identity. They're guilty because we refuse, we're guilty because we refuse to succumb, we refuse to surrender. There is this mentality in, in this U.S. administration that seems to want <clears throat> sorry, the Palestinians to admit and internalize a sense of defeat. They kept saying, you're defeated, that, that the Palestinians are defeated and they have to accept this, and therefore they have to accept our version of what peace is going to be like which is peace, that means Palestinian capitulation and dealing only with economic integration, making Israel part of the region, and at the same time improving the quality of life of Palestinians while under occupation. So all this is part of a mentality and a policy that follows the dictates or, or the priorities of the extreme right-wing government in Israel, and, of course, of the donors, funders, and the base of mm -hmm. the Trump administration, whether it's in the extreme ideological Christian Zionists, the evangelicals, or whether it is in the uh, donors like Sheldon Adelson and others, or whether it is the extreme Zionist organizations like APAC and, and others. So we see ourselves, in a sense, having to deal with an American administration that has adopted the most extreme ideological uh, position in favor of Israel that has become complicit with the Israeli occupation and that is targeting the Palestinians in order to uh, force a solution mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with justice, with international law, or with even any claim to permanence or, or justice, as right. I said.
I have a little surprise for you. Exactly 10 years ago, we spoke on a different network on Al Jazeera, and I asked you about Barack Obama, who was just getting his feet under the desk as the U.S. president at that time, and I asked you about your, your hopes and aspirations when it came to Barack Obama. Have a little listen to what you had to say to me. The most encouraging sign is that Barack Obama does not have the ideological uh, dimension that uh, characterized the Bush administration, number one. Number two, he does not have to be educated on the issue. He knows the issue. Three, he has a good team. The first positive sign was also the uh, appointment of George Mitchell, who knows the situation, who is a peacemaker, who is somebody who is respected and has the confidence of the political establishment as well. You were encouraged. Now, in hindsight, you didn't get a lot out of the Obama administration, <laughs> right? And you were so optimistic about them. What does that tell Not you about all, yeah. what does that tell you about what Palestinians are going to get out of the Trump administration now? Look, frankly, no American administration has been even handed in its dealings with the Palestinians. But at least they tried to maintain their pretense. I mean, uh, uh, there were certain red lines that they didn't cross. Uh, violations of international law, the question of the 67 borders, the ending of the occupation. These were all standard policy positions by different administration, administrations. Barack Obama was put on the defensive immediately by the, um, uh, the Israelis by uh, claiming that, of course, his name is Barack Hussein Obama, so he will side with the Muslims, with the Arabs, with the Palestinians. And he spent the rest of his administration trying to prove that he was good for the Arabs, uh, sorry, that he was good for Israel, that he was not biased. So he bent over backwards in order to please the Israelis. It was a major disappointment. Only uh, until the last month, I think, of his administration did he take one step after being repeatedly humiliated and, and uh, after Israel uh, interfered in domestic American politics and after, the, uh, um, after Netanyahu went to Congress and incited against him and uh, incited Congress to vote against the JCPOA and other things. So anyway, in the end, ultimately, they took one decision in which they did not veto a resolution 2334, which is the only thing that the Obama administration in eight years mm -hmm. did uh, to send a message that they respect international law. Now, this administration is much more dangerous in the sense that it has a total ideological identification with Israel whether, uh, as I said, on the fundamentalist religious side, whether Christian or Jewish, or whether it is on the um, uh, side of people who uh, are totally committed to Israel. They, he put together a team, with, starting with his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who has supported settlements, who was on a board of an organization to support the Israeli army. And, uh, David Friedman is the ambassador. He speaks uh, in biblical terms. And, of course, he's the one person who advocates for Israel constantly. Right. Uh, his envoy, Jason Greenblatt, who, who, who is constantly on Twitter, <laughs> Twitter right. is, is the one person who also defends Israel and yeah, justifies what he, he has. A, he has so a go at you. On, this on is Twitter. different. Yes. This is right. not just collusion. They've become... Right, right. And I'm sorry yeah, to interrupt you. They've become yeah. uh, uh, partners in crime. Yeah, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you because you mentioned yeah. Kushner. The Trump administration says Kushner and his team have a plan for you. They have the deal of the century in mind. From what you've heard of the details, <laughs> are you interested in that at all? Well, we are extremely concerned about what they call the deal of the century. Uh, they keep pushing it, they keep kicking the ball down the road, knowing that they are uh, preventing anybody else from taking any kind of initiative by saying we have a plan and we'll announce it in due time, uh, number one. Number two, what they did actively on the ground in terms of unilateral and prejudicial measures uh, betrays as, not just collusion, but as I said, the partnership in crime with the Israeli occupation, whether it's Jerusalem or the refugees or the settlements or whatever. So in a sense, they have enacted or attempted to enact parts of this deal. And these are the issues that uh, are the core issues, the central issues, the key to a solution. And they have uh, actually alienated not just all the Palestinians, but all Arabs and Muslims, particularly when it comes to Jerusalem, and of course all neighboring countries, because uh, issues like borders and refugees affect the stability and security of uh, neighboring countries, Arab host countries, and so on. 
and uh, they moved ahead uh, in ways that uh, are, uh, in a sense, antithetical to the requirements of peace. Mm -hmm. I said they have smashed the negotiating table to smithereens. There's nothing on that table. And then they're asking, they're punishing us because we're not coming to a non-existent table. This is very strange. And the same thing now with this uh, so-called uh, workshop that they are holding in Manama and Bahrain. It's, again, another diversionary tactic in order to avoid dealing with the real issues, in order to avoid uh, complying with international law and signed agreements, and in order to turn the question into how do we, you know, uh, give the Palestinians a handout while we continue to maintain Israel's control and Israel's occupation. And at the same time, how do we integrate Israel in the region? This is the dangerous part. They are putting the Arab Peace Initiative uh, on its head, upside down, by saying that let's normalize with Israel, let's turn the real enemy as, as uh, being Iran, and uh, let's uh, uh, reintegrate the region with Israel as a major economic, political, security, military power in the region. This is the danger. It's not just the total disregard for Palestinian rights, but it is a very arrogant attempt at redefining the region right. as a whole. Hanan Ashrawi, great to talk to you once again. Pleasure having you on the Newsmakers.